else. So, anyway. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let me share my screen here. Nope, don't want that. Uh, so today what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna finish the Here's about our unit sampling handout and then start on chapter six and seven. Oops, six and six. Six and seven. Um, Some internal controls. Uh, six is on the, on the internal controls for a financial audit, which is what most of you think of. Seven is on internal controls for an internal control audit, and they're very repetitive the, between those two. So I just kind of put in a, I tacked on a page and then the handout about it. It, um, it, it. It's not that. It's not that different from doing the stuff in uh, um, chapter six. And so anyway, we'll, we'll get that when we get to it. But anyway, so chapter six and seven controls. Once we finish the monetary handout, then we're done, done with the sampling part of the class. And eh, maybe next week, maybe the week after, we will have a uh, kind of a review of the, the different methods. And then I'll send out an exam that will have it on there. So, uh, but th this will be the last of the actual new material for sale. Okay, uh, let's see here. So I think we ended up, let me change this to a, get my calculator out. I think we ended up on page four on the sampling handout, monetary unit sampling. I messed up with those. Spacing on this thing. Anyway, so I think this is where we ended up, and that was kind of the, you know, what do you do when things go? Uh, the, how do you, when you have a, a exceptions, what do you do with them? And these first three, if you remember on page four, they're uh none of these are too crazy this one is the only one that's a little bit odd there's there's nothing on the audit value and there's 1700 on the book value but none of these are out of the no ordinary and these would all be included in the incremental and we'll talk about that in a second these down here are the kooky ones and this one is kooky because this method is only for overstatements. So when you run into an understatement, you ignore it. An understatement, that means there is no misstatement, um, that, that uh, it, it's, it's ignored. I know that sounds funny. It kind of goes against your <laughs> most people's uh, intuition. You say, wait, I found a misstatement. Huh? Wrong kind of misstatement. Five and six, these are the ones that are, probably, I think, by even more difficult ones. And that is when you have an audit, excuse me, a book value that's higher than the interval. And if you think about it, these are 100% certain of being picked. You know, if they go over the interval, they're going to be picked. And this one will at least cover one interval, maybe cover two. This one could cover two, maybe even three intervals. So these are 100% sure being picked. And when that happens, you use the actual misstatement instead of the projected one, which would have been smaller. So you, whenever they, the interval is, assuming the book value is bigger than the interval, you use the actual misstatement. And for these, there is no incremental allowance, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, because 
nothing else could go wrong in that interval. There's nothing else in those intervals. So this is page uh, four. So we went over, and these are the rules. If I had to do this again, I, I, can't, I think I must have lifted this out of a book or something. Um, if I had to do it again, I'd probably move this one up to that one. But um, underneath that one, because these two kind of go together. Uh, so uh, if the misstated item has a book value equal to or larger than the interval, uh, And the misstatement is that what's the actual misstatement of the item? So here's the actual misstatement. Okay, now uh, page five, we're going to kind of put it together um, and calculate the projected misstatement, which we can do on the other page. Page five or page four, number five? Oh, I don't know. Uh, page four, I'm sorry, page four, number five. I gotta redo these handouts. <laughs> I, I think I add things to them and then I don't do the re page numbering and all that kind of stuff like I should. Um, my new thing, and I, I have say I didn't do it with this one, is to make the page numbers and the, and the problem numbers the same, but I can't always do that. All right, so this one is, so this one is going to be all of them together. And we're going to do this one, calculate the mis projected misstatement, which is the one we normally do it. And then we have two more additional ones that are going to um, make you wish you didn't know this method. No, I'm kidding. But th th this is what we're going to. So we're going to go through here and we'll do the projected value uh, and more importantly, the projected misstatement. And see if it's going to be in there or not. Okay, so let's do the projected value. So we have these three items that were found that were misstatements. Uh, they have a book value of 600,000. We have these items here. So what we're going to do is do our calculations. Okay, so audit divided by book. Okay, 8,000 divided by 10,000. Eighty percent, eighty percent of 50,000. So 44,000 is a projected value and that is for that interval, that's what the projected value is, but we're more interested in this one, the projected misstatement, which would be 10,000. Okay, so this is our projected misstatement for this one. And the incremental allowance says, okay, could there be more things wrong in that interval? Well, the book value is 10,000 and the interval is 50,000. So yeah, there could be more things wrong in there. This doesn't cover the entire interval, so there could be things more wrong in there. So uh, including the incremental allowance, yes. Because even though we found something bad, it could be worse. And we'll see what we do with this in a second. Not a second, you know, a few minutes. Okay, this one here. Oops. So 
1600 divided by 4,000. Okay, so we're projecting that the value of that is Projected misstatement would be and could be more things go wrong in there. Yeah. The book value is 4,000, this interval is 50,000, so there could be a whole bunch more wrong in there. There's certainly could be more things that are misstated in that interval. So yes, this will be included in. Wait, can you explain one more time why it's included? It's because it's less than the 50,000 interval? Yep. Is that? Yeah, so you're, you're gonna compare these two. So if there is a misstatement, and the book value is less than the interval is included in the incremental allowance. So this is less than that, this is less than that. So if it's less than the interval, it's saying, look, there, it could, there could be more things wrong than just what we found. And also we're gonna find that the um, the rejected misstatement amount also plays a role in it. That uh, bigger, larger misstatements are going to have a bigger impact than smaller ones. Okay, how about this one? What do we do with this one? What do we do with this one, the last, the third one? Ignore it. Ignore it. This is a understatement. We're not supposed to catch those, and if we do catch them, we ignore them. And so this is, oops, don't need underline it on the statement, and no, we don't need to put that in there, although it wouldn't matter even if we did. <laughs> because these get multiplied by a, uh, uh, an incremental amount. And if you multiply zero times anything, it's going to be zero. But uh, we do not, uh, there's not going to be the incremental allowance. So these two are the only two that are rejected misstatements. This one is not a misstatement. And I know that kind of uh, for us as auditors, and you find something like this, you, you immediately think, well, that's that's a problem, but not for this method. For this method, you ignore it. And by the way, that is one of the criticisms of this method is that it, you know, it, it ignores understatements. Okay, so the projected misstatement will be 10 plus 30 is 40,000.
Okay, uh, I'm going to Uh, basic precision and incremental allowance. I'm going to go ahead and do those uh, separately in the overhead. And that they are <laughs> moving in my giant, uh, my giant Sam's Club thing of happy baby. It's, um, to open this and you'd think. But the, uh, oh, easy open, okay. <laughs> okay, this is beyond embarrassing. This is just sad that I can't get this thing out. Oh, there we go. It's similar to what we did for the other ones, except that we don't have standard deviations. And let me change videos here. Oh, it's sort of like this. For the, for the classical sampling, you would have standard deviations. So if this is an account, I'm just making these numbers up. Let's say that they said it was worth 100,000. And we would come up with some, that's a bad pen. Maybe it's a little bit better. You can actually see it. So for instance, if we had an account that say was you know, had a book value of 100,000. And you know, maybe we came up with a projected value of say 90, uh, 95,000. We would do standard deviations, and the standard deviations would be you know, so here'd be one standard deviation, this would be two standard deviations, and so far, so forth. So you'd have this kind of bell thing that would look like that, that would be okay, here's what we're here's our best estimate. And it could be, you know, one standard deviation away or two standard deviations away or three. Um, you know, these are all standard deviations. So if the standard deviation was, uh, I'm just making this up, uh, 2,000. This would be 95 minus 2,000 or plus 2,000 and so on and so forth. So we have these standard deviations and this kind of gives us our, that kind of bell curve thing. Now we have the same thing. So this would be for classical sampling. We have the same thing for probably the proportional size. Scratch that, I'm using the wrong term. 
um, monetary unit sampling. So we have the same thing, except the way that we come about it is a little bit different in that we have Say a hundred thousand. And if the projected uh, value is ninety five thousand. Okay, there's two things going to be different here. First of all, there's no standard deviation, so we don't have these down here. Second of all, because this is only for overstatements, not understatements, there's not going to be, it's only going to be a, what they call a one tail test. It's going to go this way. You know, so this could be worse going this way. And there's two components that kind of make up this tail going over here. Uh, uh, I don't know where to put this. I'll put it down here. Basic precision and the incremental allowance. Where's my? Where do I put my ears? The problem is I got a blue ruler and I got a blue mat here, so I gotta find it. Okay, so basic precision is kind of like the first one. We're ignoring understatements. Uh no, we're we're um I'm just going back to my last, when we were doing the last. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Ignore understatements. There's no misstatements if it's. If Correct. The Correct. Audit val if the book value is lower than the audit value, we ignore it. Right. Yeah. You notice, I mean, if we, if we had this, if this was a two tail test. Yeah. It doesn't come over here. It's possible this could be an understatement. Right. I mean, it's, you know, like up here, you know, here's the, um, you know, it's possible it could be. You can't see what I'm doing. I'm off the screen. You know, for this one up here, it's possible it could be an understatement. Even if you came up with a projected value of ninety-five thousand, it's possible that the real amount could be one hundred and six thousand or whatever. Because you know, it, it could go. This one, it cannot go. It, it cannot be an uh, an understatement. So it has to be an overstatement, you know, and this will just come down and see how much of an overstatement do we have. There is no, gee, this might be an understatement. You're saying the actual book or the projected? That's what I'm kind of confused by. Which? Well, the, the error, the error in it. Okay, the error. Yeah, yeah. So our best estimate is it's off by 5,000. However, this is sampling, so it could be off by more. And basic precision is if there are no misstatements, it's still possible that this could be further down because it's a sample. You know, this is our best estimate. But again, it's a sample. So even if there were no misstatements, it could still be off by a certain amount more. And the incremental allowance only comes about if there are misstatements. And it says, look, if you find misstatements, then that indicates that there might be more 
misstatements and there might, you know, there could be still additional ones to be found. So it's incremental allowances for when there are misstatements. So yeah, this is the basic precision. No, I should make a graphic for this. And that's if there are no misstatements. So even if there's no misstatements, you go through all of them, you don't find anything, it's possible it still could be wrong and that's the basic precision. If you do find something wrong, if you do find misstatements, we go to this incremental allowance. And that is, look, if you find misstatements, that means that this could be off even more. So this is with no misstatements. And this is with, if you do find misstatements, it could be off even more. And in this one, it makes a difference as to how big the misstatements are. Is it a little misstatement or a big misstatement? It, it makes a difference as far as how this is, how far this is going to go down. So this will be sort of our, you know, I think we're using 90, the 95 percent level. Whatever this comes out to, this will be, you know, at the 95 percent level, say it, 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 you know, it's uh, it won't go further than that down. So projected 95,000, but it could actually be worse than that. Because this is a sample, even if we don't have any misstatements, it could be worse. And if we do have misstatements, it can be, you know, an additional amount, an incremental amount. Okay, so this is kind of the, this replaces, uh, no, this up here. So this up here, you know, these are all standard deviations. It'll be, you know, here's one standard deviation two standard deviations and so on. So replacing this, and, and this could go either way. This could be overstatement, understatement. Going down here, it's all gonna be, if there's a problem with an overstatement, that they're saying it's worth more than we say it really is. Um, so this is only for overstatements. If there is an understatement, we, we ignore it. And, and so this is really replacing the standard deviation we have here. So we don't have standard deviation, but we, it is still a sample. We still have this kind of thing going on. Okay, so let me see where I'm at. Okay, so basic precision. Now there is a... Um, let me do my thing. I, I, hold on, I gotta. Uh, that's not right. So these are the reliability tables. I'm gonna get rid of those. Uh, okay. So these are the reliability tables you have. They're on the last page of the handout. I think. Yeah, last page of the handout. And you, you, you recall, oh, I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have deleted those. I need those. Hold on a second. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, so it says row zero is used for reliability factor for sample size and for basic precision. Well, that's what we're doing now is basic precision. So we come down here and we'll see that basic precision is, I copy that. So basic precision is um, the interval times reliability factor. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna come down here. And I'm gonna paste that. Um, formula. So basic precision. Yeah. 
vulnerable. Times the reliability factor. Okay, so what is our interval? Fifty thousand. Yep. So this is fifty thousand dollars. times a reliability factor. And the nice thing about uh, reliability factor, it says row zero is used for reliability factor, which makes sense because the number of overstatements or misstatements, the reliability factor is when you don't have any, right? So line zero is for the, the basic precision and that will be, what's that 5% of that? Yeah, at five percent. So at five percent, three. So this will be three. Okay. So basic precision. Uh, Can you go back to that table real quick? Mm -hmm. So we're not supposed to use the number two misstatements. I got, cause I got confused here. I thought we were supposed to, it's a number of misstatements, but. but it, well, it, it, we will use those. Okay. But, but not when you're doing basic precision. Exactly. The basic precision is for no misstatements. Okay. And that's why yeah. it's zero. That's right. But we are going to do something with the misstatements. And this is another one that could be added. Okay. Would irritate when they show it, but it's a yeah. So the basic precision will be so it's a hundred thousand. No, it's not. It's a hundred fifty thousand. One fifty. So this is our basic precision. So basic precision is going to be the interval times reliability factor, and that's always done at zero misstatements. Uh, so going back to this thing, you know, here this is saying is that this could be off by another 150,000. You know, the rejected value, I think, is like minus 40. The book value was 600,000. And the project, uh, misstatement was 40. So what they're saying is, look, okay, you know, this is a particular mistake. This is our best estimate of what they are off by. However, they're saying, look, this is a sample. And so even if we didn't find anything wrong, no misstatements, we could still be off by another 150,000. Then we go to the incremental, which is, <laughs> uh, such a pain that I hate teaching. Very few things I hate teaching. This is one. Okay, you'll see why in a second. Okay, reliability factor increments. So this is. These are the calculations we have to do. This is for the uh, on the table. You know, pull up. Um, There's a way I get them both on the same table, both on the same screen, I should say. I'm making things worse here. But. Come 
I think I can do it. Okay. So what we do, I'm going to think of something else. <laughs> oh, I know. If I do this, uh, I make this one small too. I got the wrong one. Okay, so here's our table up above. And here's the handout down below. Okay, so here's at the bottom of page. Uh, I might just do it. Okay, so this is bottom of problem five. Okay, so let's take this first one here. So we go to the reliability, the, um, you know, the table here for the reliability factors. And we are going to take the increment from between zero misstatements and one misstatement. So we're going to start out with the overstatement for one, what that factor would be. It's 475. Minus uh, the overstatement at zero. This side, which is three. Yeah. Minus one. So this is the overstatement for overstatement one. statement zero minus one. And so this will be the first incremental of the first increment of the allowance. So this will be you at uh, 475. That should be a decimal minus three as well as the other side, 0.75. Okay, so I'll show you what we do with that in a minute. Now, let's go to number two. Number two is similar. We go to two, the overstatement two, which is 6.30 at 5%. So these are all at Okay, so this is 6.30. Minus overstatement one, which was 4.75. Minus one. Uh, whatever that is. Calculator. 155 minus 1, 55. So that is our increment number two. 
And just for kicks, we're going to do it with three also. So 7.76. Point four six. So again, we just took the increments between the misstatements. Oh, the increment goes above uh, minus one. Be honest with you, I might, might, I have no idea what that's for. It's probably a, it's a new degrees of freedom, I would assume. But now, <laughs> here's what if I ever write an auditing book, it would be so easy just to make a table that would have all these already calculated. I'm not sure why they don't, but it would be so easy to have a table that had all these and you wouldn't have to do the calculation. Okay, so. Here's what we're going to do with these factors. You say, well, what do we do with them? You know, we, okay, we have these factors. What do we do with them? Well, here's what we do with them. Up here, we have these misstatements. One zero, we don't have that one, but up here we have the misstatements. And what we're going to do is put the largest misstatement first. So this is the largest. So this is gonna go first. So we're going to take the 0.75. I think that's 20, I think it's 22,000 if I put it. Okay, so this is the misstatement. Well, the largest misstatement we have is that we're going to multiply it by this uh, incremental amount. And we're gonna say, look, okay, this could be, you know, and because this is, this is the largest misstatement, so this will add another 22,500 onto the possibility of things going wrong, basically. And we're gonna do that same thing down here. Oops. So this will be 0.755, uh, I mean. And the next misstatement is 10,000.
and that would be 5,500, I think. And this one, we don't have anything. And that's why, you know, for this one, I, like I said, well, it won't really matter on this one because even if we did make a mistake and include it, it's going to be zero. So zero times whatever it doesn't make any difference. So we don't really have this one, anything in uh, that one. So the incremental allowance will be. Twenty two five hundred plus my twenty twenty eight five hundred. Oh, and so this will be our incremental allowance. I'll make these all blue. So this is what if we do have an error what happened? Okay, so it could be off by uh, 28,000 more. And again, you'll notice that it, uh, it makes a difference how big it is, right? The larger this is, the larger that this uh, incremental allowance is going to be. You know, if this was 3,000, this would be much less than, you know, so on and so forth. So it makes a difference what size the air is. So small air, small incremental allowance. Large air is large incremental allowance. And so coming back to this thing, it says, okay, the incremental allowance, uh, this would be 28,000. So what we'd be saying is, look, okay, it could be off by, you know, we know that this is off by 40,000, projected misstatement, but it could be off by another 150,000 just in general, if it was just because it's the sampling. And then this one says, okay, if you find errors, that increases how much it could be off by. So it could be off by as much as all three of those together. And that's the upper limit. So the upper limit on the mistake will be all three of these together. Hey, what's going on here? Oh, come on. <laughs> Two eighteen. Hmm. You had the three together. It was two eighteen. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yep. And so this would be the upper limit. I think it's this much. Oops. Now, this would be, it's only 600,000. This would be a very large upper limit on this statement. But, um, oops. 
what they're saying is this is uh, this is how it could be how much it could be off by. You know, one of these days I'm gonna learn how to use a computer. Ah. So our best estimate is that it's off by 40,000. However, it could be off by as, as much as 218,000. So this is how much it could be off by. Got to do. I've got to. Uh, there's no way this should be this high. I apologize for this. So our best estimate, and um, the upper limit though would be the 218,000. So we're saying, okay, our best estimate is that this is off by 40,000, but it could be off by as much as 218,000. Now, this is only a $600,000 account. So I have to think that this would be, um, You know, so they could be off up to two hundred eighteen thousand, which I would, I would assume would be material, but over a third of it. Uh, here's a question for you: How many units were in the? How many uh, items were in the sample? So these were just the items found with misstatements. But how many items were actually in the sample? Anyone? I'm not sharing my screen. You gotta be kidding me. I am so sorry, guys. That whole time I didn't square my screen, right? <laughs> I am so sorry. So this is um, how we calculate that upper limit. All right, um, anyone? My book value is 600,000. How many items do we have? How many items do we pick for our sample? I'll leave the edge of that one. Um, so this is for next week. I have you guys do this on your own.
do we know the number of samples? We only know how many they found as misstatements. Actually, you can get it from this. Oh, uh, in terms of the intervals? Right. So in other words, how many intervals go into here? Oh, that's right. Yeah, so this would be, uh, you remember you get the interval by dividing um, the book value by the items of the number of items in the sample. So you can even do the reverse of that. So you just take the, um, the book value divided by the interval. And so is that 12? You know, 12. So they don't come out and say how many they were, but they, um, these are just the mistaken ones, but you can figure it out. As long as you have the book value. Okay, so anyway, so this is, this here. So for next week, um, this is problem six. So give it a shot. Next week we'll go over it. Uh, there's some there's some kooky things in there. Uh, some of these are you gotta take a look at them a little more closely than others. But then the rest of it is down here. So that, uh, also be careful in that this we're not using five percent. We're using ten percent. So, um, you know, uh, keep that in mind when you go to the tables. We're not using the 5%, we're using the 10%. Okay. Or is, is this week 11 or is this week 10? Uh, I, think it, I think it's week 10. Yeah. Okay, so I'll go ahead and save that. And so next week we'll, we'll go over that. Uh, why don't we uh, go ahead and let's take a break. Uh, uh, let's say come back at what? Uh, Seven ten maybe. Is that enough? Let the dog out. And we will start going over um, internal control handout. We'll start going over that. So let's go ahead and take, take a break. Uh, we'll be back at uh, 7 10 and start in with the uh, no control handle.
Hello. Okay, so uh, we're going to start in on chapter uh, six and seven. And the handout is up there. I need to let my dog out. I got this crazy little dog, the rescue dog. But she's um, she's a nut. Okay, so <clears throat> internal control. Internal control is probably uh, for a lot of reasons one of the more difficult parts of auditing, or even just business itself. And Internal control set of policies and procedures designed to achieve management objectives. So, you know, it's just policies and procedures. Oh, wait a minute, I still lost my. There we go. So policies are what you'd expect them to be and procedures are ongoing. And one thing about internal control is that it is not static. It doesn't like, oh, we got perfect internal control and we can stop you know, worrying about it. It's a constant thing. But the question you might get from this is, okay, what are management objectives? And We basically have three management objectives that we are concerned with. And the first one is one, one that's near and dear to us is controls over uh, financial reporting. The second one is over operations. So financial reporting is kind of what we're talking about here with putting out the financial statements. Uh, operations are basically their day-to-day -day operations, how they conduct things um, in whatever the business is. And then the last one is for compliance. And the compliance could be with any number of things. It could be with uh, um, regulation, taxes, environmental stuff. I guess that would be in uh, regulation too, but uh, uh, it could be with, with contracts, other things. So this is kind of things that are a little bit, um, you know, usually they're internal. Financial reporting, you say, well, well, financial reporting, isn't that uh, compliance with, say, GAAP? In a way it is, but it's this is, the difference is this is usually external stuff, whereas this is internal stuff, you know, doing their taxes and they're uh, complying with government regulations and all that kind of stuff. So these are the three areas that uh, we're really talking about when it comes to internal control for our from our point of view. Okay. <clears throat> Manager's responsibility. Managers are responsible for the design and implementation of internal controls. So management is responsible for everything with internal controls. Now, it, you, you might think, well, okay, well, you know, should the auditors design the internal control? We don't do that. The reason we don't do that is we want to be objective. You know, you can't, you can't audit your own work. 
So management's responsibility to design implementation of internal controls. Now, if something's wrong, we'll you know we'll tell them about it. However, it's up to them. It's their responsibility, just like the financial statements are their responsibility. The internal controls are management's responsibility. Okay. Now, here's where it gets to be a little bit uh, quirky when it comes to audits. Um, financial statement audit. So if you audit a company's financial statements, and this is whether it's issuers or non-issuers, And this is basically what they are required to do. Test relevant control activities, but only if they are going to rely upon them. I should put one more thing on here uh, I will in a second. In the reporting, there's no opinion on internal controls. So on the financial statement audit, the audit report, it does not say anything about the internal controls. It'll say that, uh, it'll give it a, a little bit of a, a description about what they are and that they have you know, limitations on them, but there is no opinion on internal control in a regular financial statement audit. The timing is throughout the fiscal year. So it's for the entire year um, that we will look at the effectiveness of internal controls. And here's why. If the, if the internal controls were bad in, say, February, so there's transactions that happened in February that would have been impacted by those internal controls. So we we will report on controls that are, you know, the, there's a problem with them, um, but the, the effectiveness of it is throughout the entire year because it can impact the financial statements throughout the entire year. You know, financial statements are not just done at the end of the year, they're, the transactions happen throughout the year. All right, so this is for a financial statement audit. We, um, hold on a second. On my screen, annoying me. <clears throat> so, whether it's uh, for the ASCPA or PCAOB, whether it's uh, issuers or non issuers, this is what we, um, how we use internal controls. I'm gonna put one more thing up here the scope here, while this is, well, it's true when it comes to testing, I'm gonna put one more thing in here, and that is. You are required Even if you do not rely on the internal control, you are required to get an understanding of the internal controls. So you have to get an understanding of the internal controls just because you have to know where there might be a problem. Now, only if you're relying on the internal controls to reduce your testing are you going to test the internal controls. But you are required to get an understanding of internal controls. Okay, coming down here to the internal control audit, and this is generally only for issuers, although you can get an internal control audit even if you are not an issuer. The AICPA has their own uh, audit standards for um, auditing internal controls only. So the scope must test each relevant control activity each year. So you can you only need to test them for the financial statements if you're gonna rely on them. 
internal control audit is different. If you're going to make a um, evaluation of their internal controls. You have to do have to test with the relevant control activities every single year. There is no we're not going to rely on them or anything like that. Uh, the opinion would obviously be on the effectiveness of the internal control. And notice that we, when we look at this, it's the effectiveness, not necessarily the efficiency of the internal controls. So are they effective? Not necessarily are they efficient. And you test on the internal control as of the year end. So on 1231, if the controls are okay, everything's okay. Now, if the controls are not okay on 1231, then you put it in the audit report. So these are two audits. Uh, issuers will get both of these. Uh, Non-issuers. will usually only get a financial statement audit. Make them that color, I don't know what they are. Okay, so issuers will get both of these. They're required to. Non-issuers, uh, you only do a financial statement audit. Now, uh, well, yeah, we'll talk about this later, but that non-issuers generally don't have less of internal controls if you how, how big they are. Okay, so here's some things that are more kind of along the lines of memorizing for the CPA exam. Uh, control environment factors. One of the things that impacts internal control are the environmental factors. What they were to talk about there is not external environmentally outside. They're talking about uh, the environmental factors inside the building, you know, the inside the company. What's the company environment like? And so these are the things that they generally look for. Integrity, ethical values is probably the biggest one. And that is, you know, are, can you, do the people in the company, are they, do they have integrity? Do they have values or, or in some kind of ethics? Uh, system ethics, compliance thing, that sort of thing. And you can go through all these, and these are um, the, the one thing, uh, the, just part of the environment. And you remember these by IC Hambo. So IC Hambo, is a, and you, you'll see this all the time in uh, CPA reviews. Control activities. This used to be called PIPs, but it's not anymore. It has authorization, authorization of transactions, which actually is in segregation of duties, but they break it out separately here. So this has become, is it a PIPS? It becomes PEPIs. And we will talk about these as we go on. So these are kind of the things that you're gonna kind of memorize of, you know, you're going to the, take the exam. And that is, uh, just so that you, uh, it, it's, it's easier to memorize these things and, and then list them out. When you take the exam, they give you two dry erase boards. And they're, both, they're about the size of a sheet of paper. <laughs> I was gonna show you guys a sheet of paper. I don't know what a sheet of paper is. Uh, but they're about the size of a sheet of paper. And so you can actually write down, you know, I see Hambo, Peppies, and all this kind of stuff, all the stuff that you want to, all your memorizations. Is, you know, the minute you get in there and they start the test, you write all those down on one of the dry erase pads. Oh, I'm not sure if these, oh, I need to check and make sure that they still have the dry erase pads. I'm not even sure if they do that anymore. They used to. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so understanding of internal, others understanding of internal control. This is required. Any audit, you must get an understanding. 
And that's the, that's the key word there, understanding of the internal control. And you basically do it through inquiry, asking people questions, inspection of documents and so forth. Observation, this is probably, I would say this is maybe the most important one because the documents may not be accurate, what people tell you may not be accurate, but usually if you observe them doing it, you know, that's usually what they're really doing. It is possible you observe them and they're doing something different because they know they're being observed, but um, uh, usually if you observe what they're doing, that's, um, you know, that's usually what it is. Uh, tracing transactions through the system, they're seeing how do they actually how do they actually get the transactions? Uh, how do they actually uh, deal with the transactions? Tracing it from the beginning to um, the end. Okay. Entity level controls. There are some controls that are uh, go completely through the entity and that's what these are about. And these are some of the examples here. I'm not gonna go through all those, but just to give you an idea that you know, these are things that will be throughout the organization. Every part of the organization will have these things, it should have these things um, addressed in there. And so, for instance, a whistleblower, whistleblower hotline. If someone sees something wrong, they can make a phone call and say, look, there's, this is a problem. Somebody's doing this, um, uh, whatever it is. Usually a code of conduct, a lot of times people will have a, a standard code of conduct that they sign. You know, I know at, at Roosevelt University, I sign a, a code of conduct and it's like, a, and there's also a conflict of interest statement that I sign and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, you go through these. Uh, tone setting, this is actually a big one. The tone at the top, you'll mm -hmm. hear that. You'll see that all the time. And what that means is um, you know, this is usually for upper management. So if upper, upper management is ethical and they are doing what they should be doing, um, you know, that is, it kind of sets it for the whole, whole business. Whatever thing management thinks, uh, upper management especially thinks is important, other people tend to follow. Okay. Documenting, understanding of internal control. This is the first place where I break with a book. <laughs> These are the three ways that we document internal control. Uh, internal control questionnaires, which we'll see what one of those looks like in a second. Flow charts and narrative description. Control questionnaire. We're going to see that it's on the next page. Uh, flow chart is a visual. They mean to underline that whole thing. Maybe I'll pull one of those up too. And narrative description, uh, this is just a written narrative. This is uh, it's writing out what the controls are. You know, you know, some kind of a format of you know, what we do first, second, and third. Uh, I may as well put the advantages of each. By the way, the book shows the procedure manuals and organization charts. Now, the organization charts are something you might look at to get some idea of the internal controls as far as who's, you know, who has authorizations and all that. But for the most part, this is not how you document it. Uh, you don't just stick the, the organizational charts in the procedures manual and say you have an understanding of internal control. Why? Procedure manuals and organizational charts are the worst evidence. A, they're made by the client. Uh, they're held by the client. 
Um, and I can tell you that procedure manuals and organization charts are often not up to date. They often have nothing to do with what's going on with uh, the business. So anyway, uh, internal control questionnaires. You know, the advantages that anyone can administer this. We'll see that on the next page. So you can take someone who's never been on audit. It's their first audit ever. Let me get some of these so I get more room. And anyone can. Ooh. Anyone can administer the document. Flowcharts are a quick. To identify controls Oops. for knowledgeable auditors. This one is really only used for people who are familiar with doing auditing. It's a quick way of um, of viewing the controls and, and it's a visual way. It's pricey visual. Narrative descriptions. And so this one is uh, anyone can read it. If you hand somebody the internal control questionnaire or if you hand them a flow chart, unless they're into auditing, they're not going to understand what that is. They're just not. Uh, it's, it's too specific. But the narrative is just written out, you know. And, and, and when I did auditing, because I was working with uh, people who were not familiar with auditing, uh, operational people, I would say, okay, is this what you do? And I'd write it all out. And, you hand it to them. They say, well, you know, yeah, this is right. Oh, we, don't, we don't do this. We do this instead. And so I just keep going back and forth and, until this document got to be very accurate. And once I finished doing that document, then I would make a flow chart. So I give that to my you know, supervisor so they could take a, a be more of a graphical look of it. But uh, I, would, I would get this uh, narrative really down. You know, I, I, had, I had a lot more time than ex external auditors don't have time to do that. <laughs> you know, they can't spend three days going around and around about, you know, handing this back to operational people to see what's going on with it. But um, but I, I would, you know, I would spend some time and and I'd always get this really down, the narrative, and then make the flow chart of it. The nice thing is anyone can read it. You can hand this to somebody and say, this is, you know, this is, this is how they do it. This is the internal control. Okay. So internal control questionnaire. And these are nice and that anyone can do it. You can hand anyone a internal control questionnaire, anyone on the audit staff and say, okay, here, you know, here is um, the internal control questionnaire. Go in there, there's the uh, know, assistant controller and go through this internal control questionnaire with the assistant controller. And there are yes, no questions basically. You know, are all employees paid by check or direct deposit? You know, you hope that the, there's some football players is being paid by bitcoins. I think, isn't it? I, I read somewhere where there's a, a football player is getting paid by bitcoin. I don't know how that works, but anyway. So you know, and they'll either say yes or no. So yes, you know, is there a special payroll bank account used? Uh, no, and so on and so forth. And the way this works is that anywhere there is a no, that has a potential of having a problem. So a yes means there's no problem usually, and a no means there is a problem. And that is a problem of internal control questionnaires. You know, 
so anyway, so this is this goes through all kinds of things. You can, you can look through here and, and kind of go through it. But um, uh, there is a problem with internal control questionnaires, and it's just what I just kind of mentioned it, and that is you got to realize a lot of people in companies have come out of, of auditing. You know, a lot of and a lot of times people higher up in companies have come out of auditing. They, they're the ones that are familiar with financial statements and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so you show up with a questionnaire. They know what the game is. If you if I say yes, there's not a problem. So you can guess as I go if you go through the questionnaire that's yes, 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 yeah. If I just want to get rid of you, that's what I'm gonna do. And I probably do just want to get rid of you. So, you know, just saying yes. Uh, on the questionnaire, uh, people will get the idea. So a lot of times what you'll do is you'll have questions in there that will have no as the right answer. In this case, someone just keeps saying yes, it'll, you know, the, the, not paying attention, that that could catch them, you know, what they're, uh, that they're just not really thinking about what you're asking them. They're just, you know, um, blurting out the answers. So anyway, uh, so they're yes, no. Generally, no means there's a problem because these are very common uh, and people know the game. Uh, a lot of times you kind of mix them up a little bit, but even so it did these, these can be a little bit um, not as effective because of that, because, you know, the, the, you know, you may, if you're doing an audit, you may be have been doing auditing for a year. You're sitting across the table from someone who maybe had 10 years in auditing. You know, you're, you're not pulling anything over there you know, <laughs> over on them. Uh, they know exactly what's going on. So that can be a little bit of a problem. Okay. So either the internal control questionnaires and they are <clears throat> commonly used and they can be used to document your internal control. So again, this is documenting internal control. This is to have proof that you got an understanding of your internal control. Now, you do not have to use any one of these. You know, you don't have to use a flow chart. You can, you don't have to. You can use a questionnaire. You don't have to. It's up to the auditors which one of these they're going to use to document internal control. So it isn't that you have to do any one of them, but you have to document it somehow with one of those three. And again, the book says that uh, you know company um, manuals, or it, that's not going to fly. Uh, that, that generally doesn't show an understanding of internal control. And if you look up here, you know, while this one is is looking over what they have, generally these other ones are more active in actually uh, figuring out their internal control. Asking people, observing what they do, tracing the documents and all, or, you know, the transactions and all that. Okay, so anyway, so here's a, you know, this is kind of the stuff that you'd have for um, uh, different, you know, different people. This one is, I, I always like these ones. You see these on the CPA exam. I don't know if they still are on the CPA exam, but back in my day, I used to see this stuff. <laughs> are the checks pre numbered? <laughs> Like they just send you out a blank check, you know, nothing on it. Oh, well, we got number checks. Oh, that's good. So anyway, um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> risk assessment. There are basically two levels that you're going to kind of go through for your risk assessment, and the assertion level is one that we're really. Excuse me, I bored myself. The assertion level is the one that we're usually more focused on that this is what we normally think of when we talk about assessing risk. And that is any, in an individual account, what is the risk of that individual account? And they talk about this being at the assertion level. So completeness, uh, existence, uh, you know, cutoff, all that kind of stuff. So this is the what we normally think of. There is another one though, and this is at the financial statement level. And this one has come up, this is, and recently this has been more, I think, uh, tested. And that's the financial statement level, which we'll talk about in a second. 
So at the assertion level, so this is at <clears throat> um, this is at, at, at the uh, account level, basically. So cash, inventory, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> what would be uh, the inherent risk and control risk of those? So inherent risk being the transaction would already be vulnerable to threats. I mean, we've talked about inherent uh, risk before. Okay, identify potential misstatements. We talked about that, and that's always a um, that's always two factors. It's always a um, you know you have a dollar amount. Oops. And two probability. So when you, when you're doing these types of uh, potential misstatement, dollar amount and probability, uh, pinpointing the factors that we may cause it, that we controls in this area or whatever it is that. Um, Things that could affect the material misstatement. It could just be the item, you know, the account itself. Uh, cash is always one of those accounts that is, while it's controlled, it's something that everybody could use, right? I mean, you know, people can't use accounts payables. I'm not going to steal accounts payable from a company and then go pay off their accounts for them. Whereas cash is something I could definitely use. Inventory is not one. That. So sometimes the risks are based on the account and, you know, just the nature of the account is, uh, can actually um, be a, a risk factor. Okay. Then we design test of controls if we're doing any. It's possible you don't do test of controls because you can just rely on substantive testing and substantive tests. So test of controls, these are optional if you want to. And so those are the procedures, these are required. They're required unless the item is clearly not material. For instance, petty cash. You don't have to do petty cash by definition. Petty cash is petty and uh, not material. But any, any account that is material, you are required to do substantive procedures. So test controls are optional. That's only if you want to rely on the controls. Substantive tests are not optional. You must do those. Okay, financial statement level. So these are risks that risk potentially the entire financial statements being misstated. And they're usually things that come about because of uh, pressures. Um, Management and incompetence, uh, you'd be surprised what sometimes you'll hear management people say. Uh, poor oversight of the board of directors. Sometimes the board of directors don't do anything. I worked for a bank and uh, the um, board of directors were, uh, <laughs> they didn't do anything. They, they, they were just a, a group, of, they were wealthy people. Uh, they came and they sat around. They, I don't think they understood too much about it. Um, I don't think they had to, uh, for one thing, it was, you know, it was a small bank and, uh, you know, they didn't do much. Um, and I can't imagine coming to them with a problem. It would have been, uh, you know, uh, unthinkable really. <laughs> okay. Um, inadequate accounting systems and records. A lot of times you'll have this when companies are growing. When companies are growing, they'll be using some antiquated accounting system or something that uh, is clearly not for a company of their size. A lot of times that, that it's not unusual at all to have that happening. And when that happens, at, at some point, a lot of times you, things start to get, um, you start to run, run into problems with them. This year, declining economic conditions puts pressure on companies. 
if they are, you know, this last year is just terrible for so many businesses. And that increases the pressure on the financial statements, basically. You know, the idea to put good financial um, numbers out there uh, can be pretty severe. So declining economic conditions, this is, you know, <laughs> this is 2020 and probably 2021 too. Bankruptcy increases the risk. Bankruptcies are sometimes called going concern problems. They're the same thing. Or business risk is the risk of a company going bankrupt. So it, when you're reading stuff, if, if, you, if you see going concern or business risk, that's what they're talking about. A rapidly changing industry. For instance, like nowadays, uh, streaming is, is huge for companies. You have all these service companies, the delivery companies, and and uh, you know things like uh, Uber and all that that are service with uh, contracting people and all that. It, those, those these are all new, and it's one of those things that you're not exactly sure how it's going to all work out. So rapidly changing industries is also one. One domineering of executive. If you have one person that's in charge of everything, that could be a problem. Because you know, a lot of times when you have somebody who's in charge who gets their way, basically, uh, that can be a problem. That if you have one person in charge, so <clears throat> those are all things that lead to uh, risk at the financial statement level that could affect the entire financial statement. Whereas these are mostly for any given account. It's possible that you could have a combination of these that become, you know, they, they get to the financial statement level. They would usually be caused by a lot of the stuff down here, though. You know, these would be actually the drivers of, say, this up here. You're always going to find something wrong with financial statements. I, I, I don't think I've ever walked into an audit and left without finding something wrong that, you know, and not that anyone's being evil or anything like that. It's just that. It just happens, you know. But uh, these would definitely increase that um, you know, that that risk. Okay, this one is important, and this is different than when I went through. Auditors are required to assess the risk of management fraud. We always look for misstatements, material misstatements. That hasn't changed. But we were never specifically told that we have to look for management fraud. Well, a lot of times when there is a material misstatement, it ends up being something that management did, and usually intentionally. You know, it's very hard to imagine it happens, but it's very hard to imagine it happening very often where you have you know, large dollar amounts that are on the financial statements that are misstated, and management knows nothing about it. If nothing else, it'll show up on somebody's budget account or whatever. So a lot of times when there is uh, material misstatements, it is management fraud. So one of the requirements is that we must look at the possibility of it. Even though these they seem like great people and all that kind of stuff, uh, you must, you're required to assess uh, the risk of management fraud. Well, let's go here. <clears throat> um, relying on internal controls to reduce substantive testing. These first two here were, are probably fairly obvious. Um, plan the test of controls. Perform the test of controls. Okay, that's pretty obvious. Now, afterwards, though, evaluate the control risk. And the control risk can come from two different areas. Could be a design deficiency.
the control is not designed correctly. So it could be that there is a control that is not um, doing what it should be doing. I'll give you an example of this that actually happened at Robert Morris. I used to teach at Robert Morris University, so that's where I... At Robert Morris University, we had a tutoring center. It used to be on the eighth floor. It doesn't matter. But it... Well, actually, it does that matter. Eighth floor is the top floor of the building. And it, it was um, a tutoring center. A handful of students would come up every day, uh, maybe, say, five to ten maybe a few more on a different day, but for the most part, very few people showed up. Okay, in this tutoring center, they had delivered five brand new computers. They were in boxes and they were the old kind of monitors that were giant, you know, they were like a refrigerator, they're just huge. Um, so these were huge boxes that had all these computers in them. So they're delivered in the morning, I think it was like on a Wednesday or something. The next day, people came in, the computers were all gone. They were stolen. So the computers were gone. All five. Big boxes of computers. They weren't even unpacked. You know, the, IT, the IT people hadn't even come up and you know, started doing anything with them. So the next day, they're all gone. So who stole the computers? So this is on the eighth floor. It's a downtown Chicago. A floor, five computers in boxes. Who stole the computers? The conclusion of people at the school was that the students stole them. Did the students steal the computers? What do you think? I say no. No. <laughs> First of all, Five to ten students, you know, go up there every day. They wouldn't even know they were there. Uh, and even if they did, let's say that there's, a, uh, you know, well, how would they do it? Well, these are five huge boxes, so they could have, you know, if you're taking all five of them at once, you'd have to get a cart or something to do it, and then someone would say, "Hey, where are you going with that cart of computers?" So. Card, or they could have done it individually, you know. And by the way, there was nothing on. There's, there's, there's no camera caught anyone doing anything. They had to avoid all the can uh, cameras. And we're uh, it's in downtown Chicago. You have to have some way of getting those someplace. You have to have some uh, a car or truckway. You know, it's not like you can go hop on the L with five giant boxes of computer. So, you know, the idea that students took them, it was absurd. Yeah, completely absurd. And you talk about faculty, the faculty have taken them. They could have, they would, they would, faculty would have had more of a chance than the student would have, I'll put it that way. But still, you know, you're in downtown Chicago, you gotta, you know, you, taking five, taking one of them, maybe, you know, taking five, it was obviously an inside job. It was obviously somebody in the building who knew where cameras were, who knew it, and had set this up and could take them out. So, and by the way, whenever we found things that were large and stolen, it was virtually always employees. I mean, we lost little things like calculators and books or something, you know, the students might have taken, but never like large things. Um, so here, here was their solution to it. <clears throat> they would lock the eighth floor. So no one could get into the eighth floor at night. At night, you know, they did, okay, this must have happened at night. Um, you know, they were there in the day, the next day is gone. Now, locking the eighth floor, would that have helped or hurt the, uh, the stopping people from stealing computers? So they said, okay, we're gonna lock the eighth floor. So, you know, students can't get in there, faculty can't get in there, it's locked. Did that help or hurt? 
Not if the Falcons are the one that got keys and the one that stole it. If they got access to it, I don't think locking it helped. Yeah, actually, the people that stole it were probably inside people, you know, people that had access to it in the first place. And now you've just taken out the possibility that either a student or a faculty member could happen upon it happening, you know. Uh, you actually just made it worse. You know, with it, by putting this control in, this control, the design of it was completely wrong. You know, that is that was not a well-designed control. It actually made it more you know easier for whoever did it to get away with it because now there was no chance anyone was going to just happen to walk in on them while they're loading them up or whatever. So that's a design problem. Okay, the next thing on that list, I'll just go ahead and do it now. Yeah, we're, we're right near the end of the class anyways, uh, is the operation of it. And that is when you have a good control but the people running it uh, are not operating it correctly, right? So the control is fine, but people who are operating it uh, are not doing it um, the way they should be doing it. And it can be caused by ignorance. And you know, I'll say, so when I was 14, I started working in a bicycle shop um, in Rockford, that doesn't matter. But I was working in a bicycle shop and me and two other 14 year old kids back then you could work when you're 14 i'm not sure why but um we were uh hired uh to work there and bad idea because the, you know the fixing bicycles and building them and all that people more experienced they had those people doing that we at first were working the registers the cash registers none of us knew how cash registers worked and so someone come in and they'd buy something and these are kind of older cash registers and they'd print out a receipt and they said, oh, I can't really read this. And you go, okay, you try printing it up again. You bring it in again. And they're like, oh, you still can't read it again. You go over to the next register. Oh, well, look here, right this one's better. Well, you can imagine, you know, so what is that gonna look like for someone, you know, who knows anything about cash registers? What is it going to look like if you have someone ringing up the same thing three, four times? It's going to be too many transactions. I don't think it will be overstated. Yeah, it's going to look like someone's stealing cash out of the register, right? If you, if someone paid for something, you know, $10 for something and you rang it up four times, you expect it to be $40 in the register when really there's only 10. So it's gonna look like people are stealing money. And so, and that was initially why they, you know, they, they called us all in. You know, we're 14 year old kids, you know, bobbling around. And, uh, you know, so anyway, they were, you know, like, you know the money's missing that. And it just happened, one of the managers, the, you know, one of the owners of the place was looking at it and said, how come, how come these things are all rang up three or four times? You know, and said, well, you know, the ink runs out on this one. And that, and that, that was kind of realized that Okay, you know, the problem was these 14-year-old kids didn't understand that what was rung up is supposed to be in the cash register. You know, that is just a control. We had no idea. And here's the problem with that. The problem with that is someone could have been taking money. Because we weren't doing the controls correctly, it was, you know, someone could have been stealing because you have no idea, it, the, the controls were foiled at that point. Be, just because of through ignorance, we didn't, you know, we didn't realize what we were doing. And you know, I think the people running the place couldn't believe that we didn't know what a cash register did, but you know, if you're not familiar with controls and you're 14 years old, um, you're not. So anyway, that was, that's, so that's kind of the operational part of it. So the, the control was fine. Cash registers were great. However, if someone doesn't know what they're doing with a cash register, it can be a problem because not only um, will you not, you know, not only is, is, the, is the control itself defeated for that person, but you also don't know if something bad is happening that has nothing to do with that person. So anyway, that's the operation. Is that the end of the page? Yeah, so you'll have two different things. So you have a, des a design deficiency, and this is when the 
control itself is designed incorrectly. <clears throat> uh, uh, I think I already told about this one. I think uh, there was also um, an internal controller in one place where I worked where you had to have nine people um, approve anything that was brought into the place. You know, any, any all purchase orders had to be approved by nine people. Their thinking was, if you get a bunch of people, you know, that, that makes it even more secure. And the problem is, is that people didn't even look at stuff because they got hundreds of these purchase orders a day and most of them had nothing to do with their department and no one was looking at anything. Um, so it actually, I mean, it was a weakness of internal control, whereas it was actually put forward as it was better. And again, the operational def deficiency, that is when uh, people are using the control These are the controls not adequate. In other words, how are they using it is, is not appropriate. It's just surprisingly not appropriate. So that, you know, how are they using the control? It doesn't, if it foils the control, the control doesn't work anymore because uh, it, it could be through ignorance. It could be through whatever. Um, that's a good cool question. Yeah. So this, um, Citibank snafu where they accidentally sent and paid off the Revlon bonds. Yeah. <laughs> so there were three approvals required to yeah. make sure that the transaction that essentially said they would sweep into this temporary account would happen. But the way the software was built was like it triggered the entire payoff of like whatever it was, 900 something billion dollars or a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, was that, it had controls, which three people had to look at it and go, this transaction's now been approved, but the technology was so confusing. Like the actual, I saw a picture of the screenshot, it was pretty lousy. Yeah. Um, so was that a design deficiency? Yep. Okay. Yep. So like the software was confusing, so the people. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a design deficiency. The people were um, unaware of of what they were actually approving. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and by the way, you know, in computer, uh, computers are great in a lot of ways. Uh, when there is a problem, however, with computer controls, it can really, the, the, the controls can really be magnified. And, and just to give you an example, if, if I'm working in a small store and I'm putting price tags on something and I put a price tag on the calculator that, you know, this should be $10. Okay, it, it's a problem that, you know, if I put a, a, a price tag on it that says 10 cents, right? Okay, well, I sold this, it's calculated for 10 cents and it was, you know, I should have done that. But the problem you get with technology is the magnitude. You know, if I list this on, you know, Amazon at 10 cents each, before we even know what the, what, what's going on, we may have sold 30,000 of them. You know, so instead of being out five dollars or whatever, you know, you might be out one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So that is you know, part of the problem with technology, and the, you know, in, in the case that you're talking about now, that you know, they, the software basically, uh, you know, oops, <laughs> we, we just paid off all the you know the billions of dollars, and, and I think that the, we're gonna take a five hundred million dollar write off. I think. Oh, are they? Oh, I said. Yeah. I, so what happened was the 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 creditors that were fighting with them over a restructuring of this particular debt got yeah. paid off and said, "We're not paying you back." And Citibank said, "Well, you have to. This was a this was an error." And a New York judge said, "Well, if they received the money and they had it for whatever it was, twenty four hours before you try to claw it back, there would be no expectation that if you refunded their money on these bonds, they would somehow not have gone and spend it, reinvested it. Like you can't, you can't assume anything, but in the law, apparently like the actual writing of the check or wiring the money was sufficient as a payoff. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and yeah, the, it does go into disputed amounts and um, yeah, yeah there, there is, now there is something, if you pay something off early that you didn't want to, uh, 
you know, that there'd have to be, um, that you can actually try to get it back. But there is also, I think, I, I believe as part of the case was that someone would reasonably rely upon that, okay, this is a settlement. Yeah, so it was one way or another, 400 million of it went back to Citibank to basically, you know, keep the bond. Um, it was never supposed to be, that cash was never supposed to go out. But the interesting part was that the bank is having to take the responsibility over their client, which was, you know, Revlon or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's a big, big snafu because they were just the bond servicer, but here they made this huge mistake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's something that happens every now and then. <laughs> well, it's poor controls, because that's the moral of the story was three people signed off on a transaction that they thought was just going to be fine. Yeah, and, and, and you know, for the dollar amounts you're talking about, you'd think that they would, you know, yeah. but I mean, quite honestly, they probably get immune. It to was it. confusing because some of the bondholders, a, part, a portion of the bondholders were agreeing to trade out that debt for new debt so they needed to show it on their books as if that portion of the debt, call it a hundred million or whatever, was in fact paid off. And then those debt holders were getting in exchange new notes. Right. But the technology didn't um, do the sweep exactly correctly the way they pushed the button. It yeah. literally wired money to all the bond holders. Well, you, you know where you, you know where you come into that uh, every now and then you see it come up is these rogue traders. They have these rogue traders at these places too that will literally, you know, trade, uh, get, get in a hole, you know, billions of dollars, like two, three, four billion dollars, you know, and before anyone notices it. And uh, that, that's actually come up at least twice that I know of where you had these traders using the, well, you know, electronic systems and all that. And the controls are inadequate to let the bank know Hey, look, you got a trader here that is, you know, trading, you know, billions of dollars of uh, securities and stuff. Um, you know, the, the controls just weren't there. And uh, the Bank of England or something like that was sunk by one of these people. You know, I mean, it, uh, it is kind of wild that... JP Morgan had the giant, the whale, they called it. You know, they didn't know who was making these giant trades in the market. And it was oh, the yeah. Yeah. JP Morgan trader. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean it, it. It happens enough that it's you know, it, it, it's kind of it's, it's kind of crazy. And I I, I, I used to be uh, I used to work at the uh, Chicago Board of Options Exchange, and there was a case there when we were there that um, they, they 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 think it was actually what they call a Texas hedge, which is when you get two people and they both take opposite positions. The one just goes bankrupt. And then the one that makes a bunch of money, they split it up. Um, but again, you know, these people that uh, were worked at this place for like two weeks, and that's what they did. And uh, you know, it's like, hold, hold on, how, how did they get a hold of that much money? You know, to do those things. So, yeah, uh, it, this is huge, though. The you know, and especially for things like banking and stuff like that, where they. And you do get a little bit, and I, I, having worked in that area, you do get a little bit immune. I was working with accounts, accounts that were, you know, I wasn't high up in the place, but I was working with $10 million accounts and stuff, and you kind of get immune to it, you know. Uh, and, you know, something coming through for millions of dollars is not that unusual. So I imagine that's probably that was probably part of it, that they was, it just seemed like it was a routine thing, you know, that they were doing that. But uh, yeah, that would that would definitely be in the design of it, though. Um, I, I wonder who designed the system. <laughs> that's, that's another idea, you know. That, I wonder if they're going to, you know, whoever designed the system. I wonder if they're going to be on the hook for anything. So yeah, I I, I saw that story though. Yeah, and it, 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 there was something about like that if the if it was reasonable, but that the recipient relied upon it, that it was a settlement. That uh, you know. Okay, I think we'll call it a day. We'll stop there. So we're on what page? So we're up through page four. So we'll start on page five. Uh, next class. Any questions on that? So I'll do that uh, problem number six in, uh, I think I call it probably the proportional size. It's the same thing as monetary unit sampling. So that monetary unit sampling one, uh, see if you can do page five. And we'll go over it next class. We'll, we'll you know, kind of see how you. Uh, how you work it out. 
Um, if you don't want us to turn in the whole packet, we're good to just bring it. I, I'll, I'll put a drop for it. You. you can turn in the whole packet. Okay. That might not be a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. You turn in the whole packet. And, you take it. and, and don't be afraid of doing it wrong. I'm not going to knock off points for doing it wrong. We're just, we'll just go over it, though, and uh, make the corrections, you know, that, however you want to do it. So, yeah, yeah. And, and that makes sense, too, because you guys are going to send these things in electronically anyway. So, uh, you know, it isn't like you won't have it. You know? <laughs> it's not like in class you hand it in and then you don't have it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, put a, I'll put a submit thing on there and, and we'll, we'll go over it, though, and, and kind of see where, you know, but give it a shot. Don't be afraid of making a mistake. Um, and uh, you, you, will not, you will not lose points turning it in if you make a mistake on it. So uh, try it, and, um, and and I'll put a I'll put a I'll put it in the submit thing. Um, when we get off here. Right. Any questions? Okay. Well, I will put that in the uh, submit work here, and I will see you guys next week. Uh, next week we'll continue on with the uh, internal control one and we might watch a movie next week. We'll see, but anyway, okay. Um, so I will see you guys next week. Good night. Good night. Good night.